Well, I think there's a number of areas that we now have enough science to begin to delve into how do we develop in vitro approaches to these topics. Developmental neurotoxicity is clearly one that's significantly important. The in vivo approach at the present time, although it works scientifically, um, you have tens of thousands of chemicals on the EPA priority list, and in the last 10 years, three chemicals have been evaluated. We can't wait the 30,000 years to solve these problems because by then we'll have another 30,000 or 50,000 chemicals. So the problem is how do we develop better, more efficient methods to really assess the potential hazards associated with chemical use. So it's not only developmental neurotoxicity, but it's all of the organ systems, primary systems that we have to look at, have to begin to understand what are those critical events in biology that if changed, result in a health consequence. And that's where we're beginning to focus at that level. In this episode of Toxicity Tests, we're going to look at neurotoxicity. All the slides in this episode come from the Alltox website. The first two slides give a definition of what neurotoxicity is. This first slide reads, Neurotoxicology is the study of the adverse effects of chemical, biological and certain physical agents on the nervous system and or behaviour during development and in maturity. Many common substances are neurotoxic, including lead, mercury, some pesticides and ethanol, which is another name for alcohol. This second slide reads, Neurotoxicity testing is used to identify potential neurotoxic substances. Neurotoxicity is a major toxicity endpoint that must be evaluated for many regulatory applications. Sometimes neurotoxicity testing is considered as a component of target organ toxicity. The central nervous system, CNS for short, being one of the major target organ systems. In utero exposure to chemicals and drugs can also exert an adverse effect on the development of the nervous system, which is called developmental neurotoxicity. Like other target organ toxicities, neurotoxicity can result from different types of exposure to a substance. The major routes of exposure are oral, dermal or inhalation. Neurotoxicity may be observed after a single acute dose or after repeated chronic dosing. This slide describes the animal tests. It reads, Neurotoxicity testing for regulatory purposes is based on in vivo animal test methods. Four Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development test guidelines describe in vivo neurotoxicity studies. Delayed neurotoxicity of organophosphorus substances following acute exposure, which is TG418, involves a single oral dose to hens who are observed for 21 days. Primary observations include the hen's behaviour, weight and gross and microscopic pathology. Delayed neurotoxicity of organophosphorus substances, 28-day repeated dose study, which is TG419, involves daily oral dosing of hens with an organophosphorus pesticide for 28 days followed by biochemical and histopathological assessments. Neurotoxicity study in rodents, TG424, involves daily oral dosing of rats for acute, subchronic or chronic assessments, which is 28 days, 90 days or one year or longer. Primary observations include behavioural assessments and evaluation of nervous system histopathology. The OECD adopted a new test guideline in 2007 for DNT testing. The Developmental Neurotoxicity Study, TG426, evaluates in utero and early postnatal effects by daily dosing of at least 60 pregnant rats from implantation through lactation. Offspring are evaluated for neurologic and behavioural abnormalities and brain weights and neuropathology are assessed at different times throughout adulthood. 
An OECD expert group conducted a retrospective performance assessment of DNT testing in support of OECD TG426 and concluded that TG426 represents the best available science for assessing the potential for DNT in human health risk assessment and data generated with this protocol are relevant and reliable for the assessment of these endpoints. This slide reads, the type of exposure, single or repeated dose, and the outcome, lethal or non-lethal, immediate or delayed effects, will result in different classifications for substances under the globally harmonised system. GHS classifications are determined on the basis of the weight of all evidence available, including human exposure and animal studies. Neurotoxic effects sufficient for classification include significant functional changes in the central or peripheral nervous system, signs of CNS depression, effects on the senses, sight, hearing, smell, and damage to the brain observed at necrophysi or microscopically. Human data are generally not available, so that's going to make it difficult to compare it against the animal studies to see if the animal studies are actually predictive. It does seem here that they are relying very heavily on animal data to make assessments. Anyway, it does. Anyway, it says human data are generally not available, but when they are, they take precedence over animal test results. The GHS may permit the use of quantitative structure activity relationships (QSAR) and expert judgment to fill data gaps for structural analogs. Again, expert judgment usually means guesswork, as far as I can tell, in toxicity. I'm going to miss out the second paragraph and go straight to the third paragraph. It reads, Problems cited with the current regulatory testing approach for neurotoxicity and developmental neurotoxicity include high cost, long duration, low throughput and not always sensitive enough to predict human neurotoxicity. Experts also claim that the animal tests in the current test guidelines do not always generate the mechanistic data required for a scientifically based human risk assessment. So I just wonder about Dr Goldberg at the start, whether he was very, very adamant that the animal tests were scientific, but however there does seem to be some doubt about this here. This slide reads, the roles of the blood-brain barrier, now you have to remember the blood-brain barrier is going to be different thicknesses in different animals, so it's going to let some chemicals through which other animals, blood-brain barriers, wouldn't let through. And the second one is metabolism, their livers will turn over or process a drug or a chemical differently. These are going to lead to species differences for sure and it's not the blood brain barrier is just one membrane there's about three or four membranes a drug or chemical has to pass through before it perhaps gets to the target say a cell or the brain especially the brain or the central nervous system in this particular uh, area so i'm just like throwing that in just to say that even with neurotoxicity it would be incredible if there wasn't species differences Anyway, let's read this slide out from the beginning. It says, The roles of the blood-brain barrier, metabolism and toxicokinetics need to be included in assessing the potential neurotoxicity of a substance. Recent workshops have discussed how the results from in vitro assays might be coupled with QSAR studies, computational modelling and other techniques to form an integrated testing strategy for the prediction of neurotoxicity and under validation and acceptance of non-animal alternative methods it reads ICFAM, ECFAM and the OECD have not reviewed or validated any non-animal methods or alternative testing strategies for assessing neurotoxicity. Regulatory authorities have not accepted any non-animal methods or alternative testing strategies for neurotoxicity testing. These next two slides deal with some of the current scientific thinking about neurotoxicity. There's plenty of other essays and information on the Alltox website about neurotoxicity. 
Uh, I've just picked these two slides and I'm just going to read the last paragraph of the second slide so you can pause these slides in your own time to read about the science. I will say it's mostly to do with stem cells. The last paragraph of this slide reads New assay endpoints for identifying neurotoxicants and developmental neurotoxicants are being explored by researchers. For example, Monday et al looked at changes in cell morphology and protein biomarkers expressed during neutrite outgrowth and synaptogenesis using cerebellar granule cells as a model for neurodevelopment. Neurotypic proteins expressed during normal cell growth were categorised and the proteins perturbed by chemical inhibition of cell growth biomarkers were identified. The researchers found that neurotypic proteins can be used as biomarkers of neuronal development in vitro and in some cases may detect changes that are not apparent using morphologic measures. This penultimate slide from the Alltox website describes how some scientists are trying to organise themselves to bring together all the data that they have so they can approach the regulatory authorities. It reads, the application of in vitro methods for neurotoxicity for regulatory testing purposes has been discussed in several recent workshop symposium reports. These groups reviewed existing alternative methods for neurotoxicity testing and discussed approaches for integrating them into regulatory frameworks. At the present time, in vitro methods are considered complementary to animal tests because they provide an understanding of the molecular cellular mechanisms involved in neurotoxicity. All agreed that new test methods must be standardised and formally validated to have an impact on reducing animal use in regulatory testing. DNT testing, remember that's developmental neurotoxicity testing, has been cited as an area in particular need of alternative test methods both to better protect human health and to reduce the large numbers of animals currently required for current regulatory tests. A coordinated effort in the form of the TestSmart DNT program was launched to address this need by bringing together international stakeholders from diverse areas to review the science and to propose approaches for incorporating DNT alternatives into regulatory policies. Two test smart DNT workshops have taken place in 2006 and 2008. The report from this first workshop has been published and it identified future priorities as follows. Initiating a systematic evaluation of alternative models and technologies, developing a framework for the creation of an open database to catalogue DNT data, and devising a strategy for harmonising the validation process across international jurisdictional borders. I'm just going to read out this last slide from the Autox website and then we're going to end this episode on neurotoxicity by hearing from Dr Alan Goldberg again. This slide reads, Major considerations for progress in replacing animals in neurotoxicity testing include the following. Identification of the mechanisms of neurotoxicity that need to be represented in a test battery. Development of in vitro assays needed as part of a test battery that encompass relevant endpoints of neurotoxicity. And validation of individual in vitro methods and a test battery. And the last sentence reads, and I suppose this is quite important, the degree of investment in research and development was identified as the major rate-limiting step in generating non-animal alternatives for neurotoxicity testing. Well, let me tell you about neurobiology. You're going to hear a little bit about it, so I'm not going to go too far. But again, it's not that we're looking for a single assay. We're looking for the development of a different set of assays and methods and techniques be them cell culture or model systems that allow you to take that data and make a decision. That decision could be, is it causative in the disease? Is it treatable in the disease? But it, they're very good questions. 
dealing with the regulatory community and, and laws on the books is very hard to change. We did a mini study of what areas could we be most effective at in trying to get into the regulatory community an in vitro approach. And after some considerable discussion with lots of people, we focused on developmental neurotoxicity. Number one, the neuro, my own area, was there. Development was one that had essentially no regulation. And the EPA is required to test something like 35 or 40,000 chemicals for developmental neurotoxicology. And in the first 10 years, they have successfully completed three compounds. Okay? You can't do it using current animal methodology. So we set up a program called Developmental Neurotoxicity Test Smart, which is can we develop an approach to look at developing tests that would allow us to do this for developmental neurotox. The first meeting was held in November 2005, is that right? And it was a three-day meeting, about 150 participants during it, which laid out, this is where we are today, and this is where we have to go, uh, and looked at some of the broader issues. The second DNT2 test smart is now scheduled for November of this year and somewhere it's advertised on, on the board out there, the dates. And that is a program that's beginning to look much more focused at cell culture methodology and model systems and essentially developing the criteria necessary to get these methods correct. So it's a change in thinking. It's really how do you think differently about this and how do you get this? And we're, we're greatly encouraged in that to run a meeting like this is, is roughly a quarter of a million dollars by the time you bring in all your speakers from all over the world. And about half of that is coming from European companies, maybe a little bit more. The rest will come from American companies, a little bit harder to pull it out of them. So all the Europeans have already come on, but the Americans are beginning to start. And uh, you know, we'll probably have another 150 people that are scientists devoted to this area, but we'll have the policy people, we'll have the regulators in there looking at how do you use this data, what makes it acceptable. Because one thing is to develop the method and use it for scientific purposes. The other thing is to develop the method and have it used for regulatory requirements.